previously on Cascade 8 TV, I travelled to Dalmore Distillery and met with Greg Glass, who told me about some of the secrets of how Dalmore is made, particularly that adherence to a proper wood policy that really gives Dalmore its character. A wood policy carried out in a cask warehouse like this one. So we've come now to the spot where Dalmore really finds itself. Uh, around me, going back into the distance, cask upon cask upon cask of maturing whiskey. And these are some pretty big casks here, um, bigger than ones I've seen before, I think. Where we are here, this is warehouse number two. This is one of our favourite uh, where, uh, Dunnage warehouses and it's right next to the Cromarty Firth. You can hear birds in the background <laughs> yeah. perhaps there. What you're seeing here is largely our sherry uh, stocks. With our relationship with Gonzales BS, we are, are sourcing some unique individual sherry butts from there and a lot of them are, are larger than what the industry standard would be so some of them are around 600 litres. Yeah and with the casks being slightly larger than average that's going to make the maturation happen a little slower but in a place like this that time is well spent. What would you say that as a whisky maker you have learned from a relationship with a sherry bodega and what has the sherry bodega learned from their relationship with whiskey? Well it's very much a partnership so we see um, it's not just a, a supply agreement if you like it's actually like-minded uh, makers and so we work very closely with Antonio Flores who's the the, the master uh, sherry maker there as well as his daughter Sylvia who's the next generation uh, within the, uh, the Gonzales house. We're speaking about different collaborations that we can do we talk a lot about the flavours and, and hand selection. So myself and Richard, Richard Patterson, we, we go to Hareth very regularly. We're actually selecting individual casks and looking at the sherries as well. So it's actually that sort of two-way communication with the makers of these casks to look at the unique styles that we have um, from them. And we, we treat each of these casks with complete respect and in their own individual personality that they have. And through that nurturing over years and decades, you know, we get to understand them, where we might need to divert them into a different style of enhancement or cask finishing. Whenever we go to Hareth, we always take lovely whiskey there. Yeah. Whenever they come and visit us, <laughs> there's lots of sherry that comes over to Scotland too. Nice, easy communication that way. Yeah. And when you're looking for those particular casks, is there something that makes you stop and say, yes, this one? With the age, our age Dalmores, uh, when we're, we're talking about 20, 30, 40 years, we're looking for almost like an antique quality, which is sometimes quite difficult to define what that means. But in some of these old bodegas, uh, you, you know, you go in and you get this aroma that's there and a real sense of, of place and time as well. Again, because we're using, you know, 30 year old cherries, often a lot older than that. So there's linkages and flavours that we're looking at that are compatible with our Dalmore house style. And what we are, often look for is something that's quite robust, but at the same time we can have elements that are quite delicate and just add different top notes and dimensions to Dalmore. And it'll depend on the, the start of the life of that stock as well. So we'll maybe use a sometimes a lighter style or older style of sherry for a particular purpose or something young more vibrant. Wow. And what we're seeing down here, the sort of sherry, this is maybe the second stage mm -hmm. of the Dalmore's life. The floor above has uh, racks of ex-bourbon casks. Mm. So um, different uh, spirits were in both casks, but also sometimes different types of wood. You can have American oak and you can have uh, European oak. Mm -hmm. Does that have a big impact on the kind of whiskey you get? Yeah, I mean, particularly because we are, are aging or finishing for such a long period of time, then that, it's not just what the previous use was, but also that wood type that will play a significant role. So in the sherry industry, typically American white oak is embraced quite heavily. So we do use American oak, but we also use different European oaks uh, as well. So uh, Quercus Robur, uh, Quercus Petrea as well, the two main ones uh, from there. So in actual fact, the sourcing is quite diversified and we also work 
one-to-one uh, -one with the different cooperages in Jerez. So not only are we sourcing these very old, rare casks that are from old bodegas, is also we're looking at the sourcing of the, the trees and uh, from the individual cooperages through the process of sherry production through to here. And that's a long-term program. So not only have we got the advantage of over a hundred years of a direct relationship with Gonzales Bias, but we're also looking at what we can lay down for the future years because these casks are extremely, extremely rare. Mm. And that's why you see here, these are all on, on one level, yeah, you know, yeah. and we have to treat them really with respect. And because this is older wood, then we also need to be very careful with how we handle them, how we fill them and how we, how we store them. So what maybe some people are shouting at the screen and have been for years and no one's answered this question for them maybe is why always oak? Well, uh, you know, partly it's, it's down to the regulations that we have, mm. but also really identifying what the, the best type of wood to use mm. is oak, partly because it's so pliable. Um, but also it, uh, it holds the liquid well, it allows the breathability. But also when we look at the different extractives that we want, other types of woods can be quite resinous, so they actually give something that's a negative flavour to, to your whiskey. So really, uh, oak itself has enough dimension and flavour that you can create from it with the variables of how you, you know, where the oak comes from, what subspecies of oak it is, how it's dried, how it's seasoned, how we heat treat it. So within the world of, of wood types for whiskey making, with it, within oak, there's a myriad of flavours that have not even been discovered yet, let alone anything else, with all those te technologies. The real question now, and this is something that I alluded to in a previous episode, I was bemoaning the fact that Scotland does not have many oak trees left and that a cask made of Scottish oak wood is almost impossible to find. Almost, but not quite impossible, Greg. One of the things that I'd always wanted to investigate was uh, creating uh, Scottish oak casks. Now, that's something that has, uh, other people have done before and it's largely seemed to be a little bit more one-off, whereas for me, I, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could maybe build a programme um, that would be sort of all-encompassing, quite a holistic programme for the industry, uh, not just for any one single uh, brand. Um, and so it actually started not too far away from here, about uh, 10, 12 miles from here. Uh, my local sawmill visiting there and, and, and getting sections of Scottish oak and experimenting, doing, doing bench trials. And what, what I was aiming at was looking at um, getting the right sort of partners together to make it uh, something that would be uh, sustainable um, for, for, for the long term. So working with Speyside Cooperage, for example, um, some of the sawmills individually and also as organisations to look at sourcing, uh, you know, responsibly sourced oak from Scotland. I tend to have a leaning towards windfell. So mm. by nature, it's actually come down and we've processed it um, through, through that way. Um, so around about um, yeah, 15 years ago, started in on this project, which a lot of people uh, said was a bit crazy to even consider it because the received wisdom was always the lack of uh, availability of, of uh, uh, if you like, barrel grade oak within Scotland. But through um, my research, I found out that there, were a lot, there was a lot of oak that was actually getting exported mm -hmm. um, and being used outside of Scotland and therefore this, how could we actually retain that in Scotland and have a secondary sort of economy for that here and, and help to promote that. So what we end up building and it continues to expand is um, responsibly sourcing Scottish oak from around Scotland, different species, uh, different areas, different ages of, of trees as well, working with uh, sawmill partners um, to help the, the sawmill industry and using their expertise, but also teaching them the, the, the grade of oak that we need and the milling techniques for uh, cast construction. Um, as well as that, we've also started a, a Cooper training program within uh, the apprenticeship scheme that Space Cooper just started so through the process of actually creating our casks the master cooper there Darren mm -hmm. is actually teaching the apprentices there how to build Scottish oak casks from scratch which is not largely 
part of a regular apprenticeship scheme um, for that. Now, not only that are the offcuts that come out of that process or some of the byproducts are then re reused in different industries. It's, um, it encompasses um, responsible sourcing, training mm -hmm. uh, within there for the long term, also planting, replanting. So we've got rewilding um, uh, programmes within the Scottish, our Scottish Oak cast making program um, we're also looking at dedicated oak forests for the future that are a mix of different types of trees that are within there but um, looking at the long term a large part of the forestry is about the management mm -hmm. so it's it's relatively easy to plant oak trees for the future but to the grade that we would require or to if you like compete with the likes of France or parts of Spain for example it's really about the management so thinking about the long term is how you manage those trees over the decades and um, so if you plant your saplings you could be looking at approximately 30 years later going in and then starting to prune them and then nurture them and you'll manage that forest so we're sort of looking at it as a holistic approach there. It, it sounds like a particularly well constructed cask of an idea as so many facets have been covered. Really for, for me it, it was about those aspects but also about the, um, the possibility of flavour experimentation so yeah. looking at if we're sourcing it locally what can we be doing in our cask construction that can actually add different la layers of flavour mm. that you couldn't necessarily get from something that you're importing um, from there so you know it's, it's never going to be huge but I think it, for the uh, for you know, local economy for sawmills, for landowners um, and, and coopers, there is actually something there and it can possibly be developed by the next generations of whiskey makers who are to come who will improve upon it and hopefully some of what we're doing now will come to fruition for my successor in 200 years time or so. Yeah, it's, it, it's time to wait, but it seems like you've laid an excellent groundwork for them. Are there specific projects for the future at this distillery? Yeah, absolutely. So we're continuing to do uh, a lot of interesting collaborations with other makers ar ar around the world. I can't say too, too much about it, but myself and Richard Patterson are working very closely with uh, a, a couple of um, people who I would, I would, I would say are um, sort of legends in their own respective industries. And what's really fascinating about that is uh, the cross-learning that we can get from, from outside our industry in ways of doing things and approaches to, to building up flavours from different places. Greg Glass, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today and showing us how the Dalmore works. It's been, it's been really great. No, fantastic. It'd be lovely to actually share with you some examples of some of the casts so we can maybe open up and have a nose of uh, a couple of the examples that we have here. Well, I wouldn't say no to that. Excellent, this way. Last summer, Cask 88 headed out on the road to visit some actual distilleries, and now we've got a real taste for it. And Scotland has such a variety of different places that make whiskey. There are big distilleries, small ones, young ones, old ones, the full gamut. And we'd love you to join us as we go and visit. Like and subscribe. And if you have ideas of where you would like us to go, please do tell us in the comments below and we'll see you there.